I'm Professor Missy Cummings, and I am a professor at Duke University in the College of Engineering and Liberal Arts with Computer Science. I decided after being a fighter pilot, it's not a job you can do forever. Uh, and I decided that I needed to figure out a transition outside the military and I decided that I would go back into academia to try to do research on how to make these systems better and safer. So right now, actually I'm not doing, I'm doing a little bit of active research uh, looking at how to help designers of artificial intelligence algorithms make better choices about the kinds of algorithms that they develop. And I'm also looking at ways to improve computer vision algorithms uh, in terms of whether or not you should have human labelers, auto labelers, or what, what are the different uh, pros and cons of each. Uh, but most of my time is taken up. I'm working with the government right now as a safety advisor for the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Uh, I think just if we want to talk about generically cars with autonomy, and this could either be self-driving cars, real self-driving cars, meaning, you know, that you get into the back seat and there's no driver, or even cars with advanced driving assist systems where you are sitting in the driver's seat. I think the biggest problem that we're facing is that the technology is still pretty much unproven. And so we're not really sure where the limits lie. Yeah, I think it's important that we recognize that we're still in a nascent period of this research and so, or this development of a system. And so we need more testing, we need more data, you know, we need to know more about how these systems are going to perform under unusual conditions, what we call corner cases. I think we're still, you know, it's, this is still a date that is, there's no consensus on when this might be. Well, I'm not really at liberty to say right now. So, you know, I'm actively working that job. So at some point, you know, when I go back to my life as an academic, I'll talk more about that. But, you know, safe to say, I'm still thinking a lot about how these technologies are designed and deployed and tested and how the human interacts with them at various stages. So all the research that I normally do is part of this. Well, it's pretty cool. I mean, who wouldn't want to work on autonomous systems? That's uh, it's always confusing to me why more people don't want to do and in, go into this business. You know, vehicles that can do things and think for themselves, it's kind of cool. You know, I think when I was in my undergraduate years, I was a math major. And then uh, it wasn't until I got my graduate degree that I went into space systems engineering. So, you know, I, I at one point in my life, I wanted to be an astronaut. So I thought that, you know, getting a degree in space systems engineering. So I was very much into satellite design and that kind of thing. And then things change, and then I recognized that automation was really kind of coming fast and furious during my time as a fighter pilot, and that made me more interested in that. Oh, well, as a researcher, I have um, 
I am completely, Java is a huge part of what we do every day. So most of my students have some proficiency in Java. We have a Java professional on staff, so we use Java a lot. Uh, you know, the, so Python, it's funny. I mean, it's funny where people in computer science and engineering would not think that they're part of a big fad, but they kind of are, and they don't realize it. Like in my, when I was young, when I was your age, MATLAB was all the rage. And then now Python is all the rage. And in another 10 years, it'll be umpty squat is the new, you know, is the new coding rage. And so, and it's funny because they're all close. They're not the same, but they're kind of, you know, there's just a new fashion in terms of whatever computer language is. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that people, older people than me will be like, oh, and Ada was the rage in the seventies, you know? So I think that there, there are, there is a trend towards, especially what college students gravitate to. But it's funny about Java. Java consistently is the language that, because we do a lot of work in human interfaces. So we that's why we do a lot of work in Java because Java can have a lot of, um, its front end can be adaptable to kind of the interface we work. And then the back end can be and I know I'm oversimplifying this. I don't want people to get mad. It can be relatively easy. You know, you can create some middleware to talk to other languages like C++ or maybe bring Python in. So we have a lot of Java interfaces that are powered by Python, C, C++, like, you know, and the funny thing is I actually don't, I'm language agnostic. I'm so old, like, I mean, I'm so old that I programmed in programmed in MATLAB 1.0, right? And so the thing that I have figured out over time is first of all, I cannot keep up with new language du jour. Um, you know, I'm I'm marginally proficient, but I'm certainly not as good as my students. But it's rapidly changing. And I try to let my students do projects in whatever language that they feel comfortable in. So that means that if you come into my lab at any given time, we have software in several different languages. Uh, you know, um, it makes, it's a bit of a headache for me. Uh, that being said, it also makes me pay attention. You know, I learn a lot more when I'm not, um, when I don't have to, when I'm not programming in just one language or I have a team that's programming in just one language. But I do find that students need to be allowed to develop in the environment that they feel the most comfortable with. That being said, I have to tell you, um, I'm not sure my, I'm doing my students a favor because that's not the way it is in companies, right? So when you go to a company, you have to program whatever they tell you to program in. Uh, but, you know, when you're in my lab, we are not in a company yet, and I want you to have that intellectual freedom to be able to do whatever you feel most comfortable doing. Yeah, you know, uh, we do a ton of work in looking at, depending on the, the nature of the topic. So I've done research in what are the best ways to develop an interface to help helicopter pilots. And in fact, at one time I did space shuttle lunar landers. And uh, even that research that I did on lunar landers, it's like 13 years, 14 years ago, it's still being used by NASA today to think about new and innovative interfaces. And we did all that in Java. Uh, sometimes I do interfaces to help drone pilots. You can go on my website and see all sorts of newfangled interfaces for how we think you could actually help drone pilots do inspection tasks, for example, from far away to do them better. Sometimes we do military, we work with the military to figure out how to make sure, you know, I think one of the things that, that is important to recognize when you're doing interface development in safety critical systems, like for people in the military, is you need to show them that they're about to make a mistake. So we look a lot at how to show constraints and limitations because you don't want people in the military launching a missile when they shouldn't, for example. Uh, but that also plays out in driving. So I've done some driving work in the past that looked at if you were um, 
warned about a rear approaching car or a side approaching car, you know, like what would be the right interface? How does that help people understand? So when I say interface, I think people's minds just go right to a video game environment, which, you know, I mean, for the most part, we typically interact in the visual way with the world. But the interfaces that we've worked on in my lab can go any range, anywhere from the visual, audio, oral, audio, haptic so we did some interesting research you can read about on my website where we worked with the massachusetts state police and we gave them haptic vibration alerts as well as audio alerts because we were trying to warn them one of the problems that state troopers have when they pull over cars at night um, that they can actually be hit and killed and uh, this is very dangerous it, it continues to be a huge problem and so we were looking at using some artificial intelligence to predict when a car was headed right for you and it would actually alert the state trooper and basically allow them to dive in the bushes uh, when a car was bearing down on them and it turns out that the haptic alert is generally provides a, just, a, just a hair of a little bit better response time and that's consistent with the research that will tell you that people will react faster when they're when they have some kind of physical vibration on their skin I, and even if it's only a tenth of a second, that actually can matter when you're diving out of the way of a car bearing down on you. Yeah, I, this is, you know, it's basically two ways. So either I hear about a problem that some an agency is having or a um, you know a company is having meaning that we hear a lot about drones crashing into trees for example so there's a problem and so we hear about a problem and, and then we you know I get my team together and we all think about okay we've got to solve this problem how can we help drone pilots figure out how not to crash in trees right so there is I would call that kind of a bottoms up there's a problem that exists in the world. And that's indeed, that's what an engineer does. You know, so you ask, you know, what's the difference between an engineer and a scientist? A scientist uses scientific principles, you know, I would say in a more abstract way to think about how to get to some, you know, end. Uh, maybe I want to, you know, what's a new way to have a vaccine? It's very abstract. Engineers are like, darn it, we've got a problem to be solved and we're gonna go solve it. And so I bring up the vaccine thing is because I was doing research with Pfizer right before COVID became a thing. And we were doing research on how to redesign the automation in the fermentation, the vaccine fermentation units, so that there were less accidents. You would not, you do not wanna know about, you know, in any kind of biomed facility, Vaccine fermentation looks a lot like beer. Like it, when you go into these um, big facilities, there you wouldn't really know the difference. Is that a Pilsner being brewed there or is that some kind of COVID vaccine, right? I mean, it's basically the same process, but it turns out that there's some tricky elements to it and you've got to get it right. And it's not, they can't completely automate it. They still need a human in the loop. And so, you know, we had this problem presented to us that, um, that they need to find a better way. So, so this bottoms up world driven problems. That's one way I get my ideas. And then there's the other, like, you're kind of relaxed and, you know, the best ideas I have come at two different times in my life. Like uh, they are exactly when I'm hiking, I do, I like to do a lot of hiking. And so I like go on these long hikes and really lets my brain relax. And I just, I will just literally ideas will start popping into my head. And that's how, that's how I'll think about how to do research. Uh, or early in the morning when like you first wake up, you know, have you ever done it the first wake up and your brain is kind of relaxed and then boom, I will get some idea. I'd be like, oh my God. And so what I do is I actually have a, a, on my iPhone, I've got, you know, in the notes app, I just have note after note after note of crazy ideas that I have. I don't have, I don't, I can't live long enough to execute all the ideas I've had. And I think the, the trick to being a good professor is finding out 
people in the real world is finding out, finding, getting ideas that can be funded. That's very clear, right? Like you got to get some money to back your ideas. And every now and then you don't need money. You might have a free student from the National Science Foundation or, you know, something like that where I don't have to have money. And then we have the liberty to kind of execute an idea. And I'm, I have one of those students right now where I, I have some extra money that doesn't have any strings attached to it. And one of the things that one of my students and I are working on is how to adapt cell phones and just interfaces in general to older people who won't admit that they've got a vision problem. So, and of course, you know where that idea came from. It comes from my everyday life because I'm old. I'm getting old, right? And I don't, I'm so vain that I don't want to admit, or I don't even recognize like, am I squinting? Am I zooming in a lot on, you know, if I'm on an iPad or a, a iPhone or, you know, any kind of smartphone, am I zooming in so much? So it might be good. Wouldn't it be good if people who, uh, cause I got news for you, everybody gets older. Uh, so there's a huge population, but there's also people with their visually impaired for a bunch of other reasons. And it's crazy to me that technology has not yet figured out how to automatically adapt to people with any some kind of vision issue so there's no one funding this we're just doing this for because we're interested in it and we think it's a really important question and i think if we can actually even get 50 percent successful then i think people would be interested in this problem Well, I mean, I think that's, you know, it, it depends on who you are as a person when you decide to go down a particular path. You know, I, there are some engineers who work on extremely theoretical formulations of, you know, I want to look at developing some kind of new airfoil that gives me some kind of theoretical limits. I mean, I'm not... I'm not saying that that you shouldn't do that. I'm just saying there are some people who, who very much are in this abstract theoretical space and you need those people. Um, I would say about academia, the right balance is probably 20 to 80%, meaning you need about 20% theoreticians and you need about 80% applied experimentalists. And that's what I am. Like I'm right in there like, and, and this is very true with the work I'm doing with computer vision. Look. I'm all, I, I'm, I like neural nets, neural nets. I, I think it comes to a big shock to a lot of young people out there. Like neural nets have been around, you know, ever since I was rocking on that rocking, in that rocking chair on the front porch, like neural nets have been around a long time and they have been, they have always had some interesting applications. It's only been relatively recently that they've become even useful because of the increased computational power that we've got from modern day computers. But the problems with neural nets still remain. It's garbage in, garbage out. So if you have bad data going into a neural net, you're gonna get bad uh, outcomes. And I do not think that the computer science community, including engineering, electrical and computer engineering, or, and by the way, every Tom, Dick and Harry in engineering are using neural nets to solve problem fill in the blank uh you know you still are a garbage in garbage out world and i do not think that we've really gotten to a point where we recognize how to flag garbage data going in we think it's good but I have to tell you like we're terrible engineers are terrible because we want to take shortcuts and like one of the biggest shortcuts i see right now is this automated data labeling so you know you run a bunch of images through an automated data, la data labeler, data labeler, which tells you, okay, you've got that's a car, that's a bus, that's a train, uh, and it turns out there's any it, it, you can go anywhere from a ten to twenty percent, maybe even more errors in the automated data labeling. I, nobody's nobody's got a quality assurance department that's making sure the data is right, right? So this is actually a huge problem. It's a systems engineering problem that engineers and computer scientists are not doing enough to assess if I've got junk data or if I've got a percentage of junk data, what what would that mean for the outcomes? And I think this is huge. It's a, and it's part of the big effort that I'm doing right now. Look, uh, I wanna know if I were being operated on by a robotic surgeon, I would be like, okay, what's your, uh, how much of your data was junk that you learned 
thing Exxon, like if you, if you have any kind of automated robot, like I want to know how junky your data was, right? I'd like to come up with the Missy Cummings junky data score uh, on any application because I promise you it's going to be higher than it should be. No, I think computer science is that it is it just it's core to because computers are core, right? So it's funny. I, I even though I'm an engineer, I in all my academic positions, I hold cross appointments with computer science departments because my work is so computer science heavy. I would like us to get away from thinking about computer science as a completely different field. If it were up to me, if I were the queen of colleges, uh, I would make everyone take computer science as like a language. Just, you know, I think English, history, computer science, I believe everyone should have it. That's not to say everyone should need to be a crack coder who's, you know, um, hacking into the Russian you know, uh, power grid at any time. You know, I don't. I don't think everybody has to be that good, but I do think that everyone, liberal arts, engineering, medicine, law, public policy, I think everyone should have a basic proficiency in computer science because it is just so core to everything that we do. So then, you know, I think computer science is an enabling technology. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't have computer science departments per se, but I think advanced computer science topics are where researchers spend their time. But for example, and this is not a very popular opinion, I have to tell you that I think all engineering students, I don't care what you're choosing. I don't care that you want to be a mechanical engineer, for example, you still need to know computers and you still need to know in today's world, Python, you know, in 10 years, it might be empty squat, but today you still need to know a lot of Python. So I think all engineering students should be proficient in Python. And it turns out that that, that does get some pushback depending on what school you're at or who you're talking to. But the reality is, and, and this is why engineering just in general, I think has, we need to get away from stovepiping and really more interdisciplinary connectivity with computer science, it's because there's no engineering problem that you're solving today without computers. Well, I love problem solving. I mean, I wouldn't be doing this job if I didn't like problem solving. Uh, I, the name of my lab is the Humans and Autonomy Laboratory. So it's all about the cohesive collaboration between humans and automation, which is really computers. So what really excites me is when we can develop results where humans and computers are really working in some kind of synergistic environment and really the two, the, the blending of the two are better than either alone. So that Pfizer, I mean, I tell, tell you, I was working for Pfizer. The fact of the matter is humans are really terrible at monitoring processes like vaccine fermentation. And that's in theory, something that computers are good at, except that when there's a sensing issue or a problem that needs to be solved, computers are terrible at abstract problem solving, but this is where humans are really, you know, they rule, they reign supreme. So being able to figure out to how to design an interface to let the, the computer do the grunt work and have the human come in to do the high level abstract reasoning, and then to have a successful solution come out, that's great, right? That's great because I think it gets people's minds in the right space to say, aha, I'm using computers, not necessarily to be job replacement, but rather to be job augmentation. And then it allows the human to go on and be more productive and actually be happier to do less boring and routine tasks and let the human come in and bring in their problem solving, which is where they reign supreme. I, I mean, yeah, they're out there. There's a lot of women. Um, I, I wish there were more. It's a very unusual relationship between women and computer science. In the 70s and the early 80s, computer science was hugely popular with women. 
and then something happened. Uh, then they started fleeing like rats off sinking ships. And now computer science is really much more male dominated. And so this is an interesting question about how did we get there? Like, why, why is it that women have become less enchanted with computer science? And I've seen some of this, right? I've seen it become a boys club. Like I was a fighter pilot. I know what it's like to be in the ultimate boys club. You will never be in a more testosterone driven environment like you will be with a bunch of fighter pilots. That being said, I've hung around a lot of computer science companies, space companies. I come to Silicon Valley quite a bit and I hang out with um, coders a lot. It's a pretty high testosterone environment. Higher, it was shocking actually to me, shocking that, that there were so many similarities between computer scientists today and what I would, the ready room of fighter pilots in my past. I'm not really sure how that happened. It's funny because I think of computer scientists really more like the revenge of the nerds. You know, I'm dating myself with that movie, but I'm like, wow, you know, like it just goes to show you how times have changed where, you know, that cohort of men have taken on, can take on, not, not, not in every situation, but can take on um, some very, I think counterproductive and maladaptive um, heavy testosterone traits, which tends to drive women away. So I think the, I think this is bad. I think it's bad because I recently saw a company really pat themselves on the back for doing a great job developing new computer models of women. I'm not going to tell you who that company was or exactly what it was. They're like, look, we're so awesome. We developed uh, a new computer model of a woman. And there wasn't one woman on that team. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not buying it. You know, I don't think you, I don't think you did have a, you, you do really have like, I mean, you need women on the team because guess what? Half the world are women, especially in Silicon Valley, right? If you're to do product development, you better have a woman on your team to help you avoid some tricky, not just one, but many. Um, unfortunately, the rest of the world doesn't listen to me, sadly. So there's still problems. Do it. Um, I love the girls who code um, groups, uh, summer camps, get into it as soon as possible. Uh, I think that the exposure, and you know, this goes to, you know, equity of who's being exposed to what topic across the country, but you know, some, some cities and towns are better than others about making sure that those opportunities are available, but getting involved early is, I think, hugely critical, but also making sure that the environments are welcoming. You know, I think it's been hard. Computer science seems to be this isolated, in some people's view, it seems to be a very isolated environment where you it's just you working at your computer and that seems to turn a lot of women off. The problem though is that they, you know, that, that companies and or universities and or aid government agencies don't really at least explicitly set up the team environment. Because I guess what, in the real world, anybody who's ever worked in the real world, even in coding, it's all team-based. Even if it's you individually going back to your cubicle to figure out a particular problem, you're still on a team. And I think that we don't do enough to demonstrate, explain, advertise that even coding, it sounds like it's a singular activity, but it's actually a big team environment and you've all got to get together and pull on this team. And, and so I wish, I think that that, is, that was one recommendation I could give to companies and other groups. And, and this is true in academia. Like, look, students, and it's even true topically, no matter what we're talking about, even outside of computer science, students hate working by themselves. Young people don't want to work by themselves. I think if anybody should take anything away from so social media, it's how interconnected people want to be. And so if we're going to raise the footprint of women in computer science, we need to show that this is a team environment and really 
invest a lot in building the teams instead of letting the stereotype continue that it's all just one person coding in one room by themselves.